Hi, I'm Peter Adamson, and you're listening to the History of Philosophy podcast, brought to you with the support of King's College London and the Leverhulme Trust, online at www.historyofphilosophy.net. Today's episode will be an interview about Plato's sophist with Fiona Lee, who is a lecturer in philosophy at University College London, and who's done a lot of work on this dialogue. Hi, Fee. Hi, Peter. Thank you for appearing on the podcast. You're welcome. Before we get into the sophist itself, I wanted to start by asking you to say just a little about the theory of forms. If you had to summarize Plato's theory, if it is a theory, in dialogues other than the sophist, so maybe the Phaedo, the Republic, what would you say? I mean, what's the point? I would say that forms are that which explains things having properties that they have. So if there are lots of things that are beautiful, a beautiful dress, a beautiful day, a beautiful city, all of those things are beautiful Plato thinks um, because the form of beauty makes them beautiful. So it's an explanation and a cause for all the things being what they are, having properties that they have. That answer obviously focuses us on a metaphysical or causal role of the forms, but I guess they're also supposed to have an epistemological role as well, right? Right. If you can discover the thing that explains in what sense all beautiful things are beautiful, and indeed explains them being beautiful, then Plato thinks you've discovered something that looks like the definition of beauty, so that if you express it, put it in linguistic terms, you've discovered the definition of beauty, for instance. And that obviously plays an epistemological role. And then you could maybe use that to check whether your opinions about things being beautiful were in fact true or not. And maybe even come to know which things are beautiful. Right. Because if something satisfies the definition, it's beautiful. Okay, so the primary object of knowledge, if you like, would be the form of beauty. But that then allows you to um, check your beliefs about other things being beautiful and perhaps come to knowledge. That's debated, of course, by people with that. I I guess the weird thing about this, though, is that it seems like the causal role of the forms could come apart from that idea that we're checking why things count as having certain characteristics like beauty. I mean, why think that the thing that causes something to be beautiful is going to be the object that's defined by defining the word beautiful? I mean, why couldn't, for example, why couldn't the thing that causes things to be beautiful be, say, a goddess of beauty, and then the definition of this goddess obviously wouldn't be a definition of the concept or the word beauty. Right, so it's obvious that you could pull apart um, a definition, an abstract definition, from a cause, and indeed in contemporary philosophy that's what people do. But for whatever reason, Plato seemed to think that his forms were causes, and Certainly if you find something that is the cause of something by uh, being the nature, itself being the nature of beauty, and if you think that acts as a cause, it's certainly going to follow that um, if you discover that thing, you'll discover what it is that all the beautiful things have in common because they satisfy that definition. So if the form of beauty just is whatever is the real thing uh, out there in the world, Plato thinks forms are real, if the form just is that real thing out in the world that embodies somehow the nature of the property beauty, then that's going to serve an epistemological function. So something can serve both functions, or at least it's coherent or plausible for Plato to have thought that something can serve both functions or fill both roles. But it's also the case and very clear that he need not have gone for something so big and bold that he could have thought the cause the causal role comes apart from the epistemological role. It just seems clear from the dialogues that he didn't. Right, so maybe it would even be fair to say that the point of the theory of forms is just to claim that when you get hold of a definition of beautiful or beauty, that what you've gotten hold of is the cause of things being beautiful. Would that be a fair way to just summarize the theory? The point of the theory of forms? Yeah, sure, why not? The point of the theory of forms. Uh, It could be. Okay, I'll take that for now. (laughs) Let's go along to the sophist. This is not a dialogue I have discussed yet. Uh, So maybe you could just kind of tell us what happens, who are the characters, what's the point of the discussion? So the main character, um, often thought to be Plato's mouthpiece in the dialogue, is uh, unnamed. So it's a mystery guy um, from a city called Elia outside Athens. So the stranger, as he's often referred to, the stranger from Elia, 
is the main speaker. He's talking to Theotetus. He's a young man, Theotetus, and he's talking to Theotetus according to the fiction of the dialogue the day after Theotetus has been talking to Socrates in the dialogue called Theotetus. So it's the, it, this takes place the very next day, apparently. And Theotetus has been talking with the stranger uh, prior to the dialogue's opening and they run into Theodorus and Socrates. Um, and there are some other people there, but they're the, the two people who speak throughout the dialogue for the most part are the Eleatic stranger and Theotetus. And presumably it's important that the stranger is from the city where Parmenides is from, right. so the Eleatic philosophy is Parmenides' philosophy. Absolutely. So um, Parmenides' philosophy is referred to and um, brought up many times in the dialogue. The main point of the dialogue is to uh, say just what a sophist is. So I don't know if your listeners know much about sophistry. Yeah, I do have done an episode on okay. the sophists. Right, so they want to try and define what a sophist is and whether or not a sophist is different from a philosopher on the one hand and a statesman on the other, or if all three names are names for the one thing, um, or if they're separate. And the stranger says that he can uh, say whether or not they're the same or separate, and he thinks they're separate. But going through the explanation is a, is a long uh, process, and he'd like to do it by a question and answer session with a compliant interlocutor. So he wants, he doesn't want to just give a speech where he's the only one talking. He wants to proceed by questions and answers, but he wants someone who's only going to let him know if he really doesn't follow what he's saying. He doesn't want someone to be challenging him at every point along the way, or well, that's how I read that bit. Anyway. He's happy to ask extremely leading questions and just have the person say yes all the time. Unlike Socrates, maybe? Right. Well, he, he doesn't just ask questions. He, he puts forward views the whole way through. And it's as if he wants the interlocutor to only interrupt him when he's really not understanding what's being proposed. There's a lot of positive doctrine, I guess, it's called often, um, presented in the dialogue. And I guess some people think that Plato is here moving away from the idea of dramatizing Socratic discussions, even though he's holding on to the question and answer format. The questioning is not being done by Socrates, and the questioning seems to be rather different because the person doing the questioning really has an agenda and a theory that he wants to push. Right, so Socrates famously didn't put forward his own um, beliefs or, or state doctrine for consideration, um, whereas the Eleatic stranger makes various proposals. Um, so he's not just questioning the views that somebody else holds. In fact, we don't find out very much about the views that Theotetus has in the Sophist. He puts forward his own views, and the question he puts to Theotetus is more or less along the lines of, isn't that so, don't you agree? It's interesting, isn't it? Because in the Theotetus, Theotetus is actually allowed to come up with all the theories of right. what knowledge is, and then right. these are considered one, and one after another. Right, so whereas in the Theotetus, Theotetus really does submit all the proposals that they consider... The Eleatic stranger, or the stranger in the sophist, um, puts forward practically all the views they consider. Theotetus learns along the way, and occasionally he says, for instance, oh, I know the answer to that one. And he draws on what's been said earlier to propose something, because he's a bright young man. The clever kid in class. Right, exactly. But mainly it's the stranger's proposals. And the purpose of the dialogue ostensibly is to define what sophistry is, what a sophist is. And they attempt to do this following the so-called method of collection and division, um, as the stranger proposes that they do. And the method is um, one whereby you take a very general class of things and then you divide them according to differentia. And you keep performing these divisions on the classes, the ever smaller classes, until you find the very thing that you're looking for. So the example that the stranger gives to make the method clear um, is the, uh, the quest to find out a definition of angling, what a, a fly fisherman is, basically. And he starts off by um, dividing all the different sorts of hunting mm -hmm. until he gets down to the very small group of uh, angling. And he always divides into two classes and picks one or the other and then subdivides that into two more right. classes until you get to a definition which is basically just a list of the divisions that have been accepted. Correct, correct. And not, not, it's not always the case that the two divisions, the two classes um, that are isolated in the divisions are named. Sometimes he says, oh, and this is a nameless thing, but right. we know what it is. Okay. And then they do this with the sophist actually several times and right. they come up with different alternative definitions, right? Right. And one of these asks us to consider the sophist as being a maker of images, which 
is connected to the idea of falsehood, and that brings us to the most important and famous part of the sophist, which I guess is what we should probably spend the rest of the time discussing. Right. That brings us to this famous problem, which is raised sort of around the middle of the sophist, the problem of non-being, which seems very appropriate given that, as we said, the strangers from Elea, the city of Parmenides, it seems to relate to something in Parmenides, some kind of Parmenidean problem of non-being. So can you explain what the problem basically is? As it's introduced in the dialogue, the problem of non-being comes up because they want to say that falsehood is real. So um, the sophist has been isolated as somebody who sells falsehoods for money. Um, sells images for money and these falsehoods can be dangerous because he's not advertising them as such so at this point in the dialogue the stranger says but wait the sophist would deny there's any such thing as falsehood because to say what falsehood is involves introducing the concept of non-being and Parmenides where I come from has said that there's no such thing as non-being we can't think or talk about non-being so falsehood is either saying what is when in fact it is not or saying what is not when in fact it is as they say in the dialogue. So um, falsehood involves not being. What is non being? And the stranger decides that what he has to do is explain that not being is, and in what sense not being is. Which sounds contradictory. Right, it sounds really contradictory. So what's the problem with not being anyway? Parmenides might have had a particular problem with non being, and there's no real comment on that in the sophist, so I'm going to leave that aside. Okay. in answering the question. But if your concern is falsehood, as Plato's concern was in the sophist, you might think that the problem of non-being concerns states of affairs that don't obtain. Could you give me an example? So you might say that it's a lovely day outside today in London. So it actually you... is. She's not making that <laughs> up. It's really a lovely day for once. So you might say uh, it's not raining. And that's a true statement, right, today. It's a true statement. And it's true because outside it's a lovely day. But you might say it's true because outside it's not the case that it's raining. Mm -hmm. So a negative state of affairs is the state of affairs in which it's raining, which is a state of affairs that isn't true, that doesn't obtain. So the idea would be the reason that it's not raining is that the thing that isn't, namely the raining, it's ra the raining yeah. is out there, as right. it were. And so we have something that isn't that is, and that's the puzzle? Possibly. Um, maybe I'll try and explain it more clearly. The problem of non-being could be thought of as either a state of affairs which is inherently negative, so the state of affairs in which it's not raining, um, somehow being real. And that's strange because in fact when you think about the state of affairs that does obtain, there's nothing to do with rain, it's just blue skies. So the negative aspect of that is said perhaps to be manifesting itself somehow, but it's hard to understand how that's the case. Or it could be in the case of falsehood, if I say it is raining, um, that I've expressed a state of affairs in my false statement that it's raining that fails to obtain. So you might think that the problem of non-being is a problem because it involves the notion of s these states of affairs that are negative somehow, that don't obtain. And really all there is out in the world is the states of affairs that do obtain. In other words, the way things really are. There's no way things aren't out there in right. the world because the world is just everything that is the case, right. to quote Wittgenstein. <laughs> so there are only positive states of affairs. Right, okay. So that's the problem. If that's the problem, at least as Plato sees it, is it too nasty if I just ask you what the solution is? <laughs> well... So for Plato, the problem um, is also a metaphysical one. If he thinks, as I take him to think, that different things have properties by, in virtue of participating in forms, then everything that is the case is the case because various things are participating in forms. That's the explanation on a metaphysical level of all the positive states of affairs. And it's not clear how he can explain negative states of affairs. Right? Is it that somebody, if somebody is ugly rather than being beautiful, is there a form of ugliness and that they're participating in that? Is Plato going to have to countenance lots and lots of negative forms? Um, and you might have something, you might have a property that isn't a property um, 
which has an opposite. So you might have the idea of largeness that has the opposite property, smallness, but you also might have the idea of equality. So if you're conceiving of measurements, Plato might need to postulate lots and lots of forms to account for all the positive states of affairs, all the, um, all the ways that things really are. You also might think that he could say or might want to say that things fail to participate in a form. But a failure to participate is a, is a strange thing to explain. He's already faced with the difficulty of explaining what participation is. So a failure to participate could be a difficult thing to explain. Would it be fair to say then that it's like he started out in, say, the Phaedo or other dialogues like that, maybe the Republic, by trying to explain how it comes to be that certain things are true? For example, that Helen is beautiful or that the stick is equal to that stick or whatever it is. And he's kind of got a nice theory of truth, namely that these truths come about because of participation in forms. And then he thinks, okay, next step would be trying to explain falsehood, especially since there were these sophists running around saying that it was impossible to say anything false. So it was a kind of pressing problem for him dialectically as well as philosophically. Right, that's how I see it. Okay. Definitely. And so that's maybe a, a more deep understanding of why the problem is a problem for Plato, but it mm -hmm. still doesn't sound like a solution. No. So he wants to explain how things, um, how falsehoods are possible and how negative predications generally are true, or can be true, by way of analysing positive states of affairs. So <clears throat> Theotetus is flying is an example from the dialogue. So Theotetus is sitting down opposite the stranger from Elia during their conversation. So they consider the, um, the statement, the Logos, Theotetus is flying. And it's a false statement. So the analysis, as I understand it, though this is controversial, people understand this differently, um, the analysis that Plato offers is that Theotetus is participating in some forms and he's participating in directly or indirectly difference from mm. other things. So we explain... Um, Theotetus is flying being false because what's happening is that he's participating in sitting mm -hmm. so Theotetus sits and that sitting either people say that either sitting itself the form participates in difference in relation to flying or that Theotetus as well as participating in sitting or perhaps because he participates in sitting thereby participates in difference from all the things that are participating in flying so there are two different I guess, well, there are other interpretations as well, but they're two uh, fairly prominent ones. And however you cut it, the solution has something to do with saying that all the work of negation is being done by the form of difference. Right. And there's a form of difference and a form of the same. Right. Right. So I guess that idea there would be that if you're sitting and I'm sitting, which in fact we are, mm -hmm. then we both participate in the form of sameness as well as the form of sitting, and that's why the two of us resemble each other in this respect so that we're both sitting. Is that right? It could be. <laughs> I, think, I think that's really difficult. But the reason that I say it's difficult is that we don't get such cases in the dialogue. Where we do have cases of things participating in difference and sameness are cases of forms participating in difference and sameness. So we don't have a, a, a lengthy or complete or detailed analysis in the dialogue of any non-forms, so you and I are not forms, any non-form subjects participating in uh, sameness. Or difference in fact. And I guess that's really one of the breakthroughs or possible breakthroughs of the sophist that Plato starts to think about not just things like me participating in forms or right. sticks or stones participating in forms but forms participating in forms so that he's able to say that one form participates in difference by being different from another form. Exactly. And there are five forms that he focuses on, right? Yeah. Namely being, motion, rest, sameness, and difference. Correct. Right. The greatest kinds. The greatest so kinds. Called. Okay, well that sounds like it might be a breakthrough if we actually need to think about form sharing in one another. But why do I need to think about form sharing in or participating in one another? Why isn't it enough to think about sticks and stones and Helen participating in forms? Right. So you might want to, uh, if you're Plato, you might want to analyze or consider forms as things that have properties on their own and it could be the case that in the past if you were Plato you worried that forms couldn't 
have properties in their own right, or if they had properties in their own right, that other problems, such as the third man problem, the might arise from right. the Parmenides. I looked at that last time, yeah. So um, it could just be the case that Plato wants to get clear, right, about whether or not forms which are the embodiment of properties, the sorts of things that if we discovered, we've discovered a definition of some property, the very nature of a property, that he wants to get clear on whether or not properties can have properties, whether second order properties are possible. Mm. And one, that's one way of looking at the dialogue and some people have thought that that's what he's doing. So if you think that the form of motion might be a numerically distinct form from the form of rest, and indeed the Eleatic stranger argues that it is, you might think that it follows from that, that it's got to have the property of being different from the form of rest. But then it follows that the form of motion would have to participate in the form of difference in relation to the form of rest, just like anything else, just as you participate in the form of difference from being different from the chair or from me. And Plato might have thought that that was a potentially difficult thing to say or potentially problematic thing to say because then forms would have properties um, in a perfectly ordinary way just as other things have properties. Um, but for, what, for whatever reason, by the time he gets to the sophist, he is prepared to say that forms participate in one another or can participate in one another. Not all forms participate in one another. So it seems to be the logical forms that forms participate in. So the five greatest kinds in the sophist anyway all share in the form of sameness. So they're all the same as themselves. Oh, right. They're all self-identical. Yeah. And, and they're all, all different from other forms. Right. So they all share in difference. Um, there's, a, there's an implication, there are passages which suggest that all forms share in being. Certainly motion and rest share in being explicitly. Um, but the implication is that all forms share in being. Um, but no forms are said to share in motion or in rest, in fact, in the dialogue. We're almost out of time, but let me ask you just one last question, which is a little bit speculative. Do you think that part of what Plato's after here is to give philosophy something to do? Because if you just say, well, okay, so there's these beautiful objects, they participate in beauty, that's why they're beautiful. Right. But that's not really philosophy, right? I mean, philosophy is not just observing that beauty makes beautiful things beautiful, because that's said to be a safe and simple-minded solution to the Phaedo. Right? But here's maybe a really tough question. Think of all of the kind of important concepts that you need in order to understand the world. Now go figure out how they relate to one another. So in other words, figure out how the forms participate in one another. Is there some possibility that he's saying that that's what dialectic is in his sort of special philosophical sense, or that that's what the philosopher would do? Or do you think that that's just kind of crazy? Well, no, there's actually a passage in the dialogue where That's he says that working of, yeah. out the interrelations between the greatest kinds mm -hmm. is dialectic, and that that's precisely what the philosopher does. So whether it's working out the logical relations between the concepts, or whether it's working out what follows the entailments um, of the relations between the objects given the world that we have in front of us, mm -hmm. is, is an interesting question. And I guess maybe poses a problem as to whether the philosopher is not very interested in the physical world around us, because now he's going to be spending all his time thinking about how forms relate to each other, or is thinking about how forms relate to each other just a way of thinking about the things around us. So I think what you said earlier about uh, truth and falsehood is relevant here. So if in the past Plato was concerned to give a metaphysical analysis of the states of affairs that make our statements true, then of course he's going to be concerned with giving a parallel analysis or equally, um, an equally satisfactory analysis of the kinds of states of affairs that make statements false or make negative statements true. Um, then if the relations between forms are a necessary component of that, then he's definitely concerned with the world because he's concerned with how our statements can be true and false about the world. He's concerned with making sense of the idea that Theotetus sits is true and Theotetus flies is false from a metaphysical point of view. So he wants to provide a metaphysical account that can explain the phenomenon and make our statements, explain how our statements about the phenomena can be true. And speaking of statements about phenomena being true, next time I'll actually be looking at a whole dialogue of Plato about language and how language refers to the world, namely the Cratylus.
So please join me for that next time. But for now, I'll just thank Fiona very much for appearing on the show. You're welcome. And please join me next time for the history of philosophy without any gaps.